thank you for coming. First of all, let me say that. Sometimes I forget that. But um, you're Americans. And you're interested in America. And when we say to people, uh, people say, well, I'm an American. Well, what, is, what does that mean? What, what do you actually believe in? Well, I believe that we should uh, distribute the wealth. Because it's not fair that somebody has more than another. That's not America anymore. Yeah. That's not America. We, we got to figure out what, what, is, what is it all about? What is America? We are Americans. We have um, American citizenship, most of us. Uh, but uh, we've kind of lost what that all, all that means. Uh, we've kind of lost what the purpose of the country was. And uh, this has never happened before. We've never had anything like this in the history of man that we have now. Uh, particularly when we started. So um, this lesson today is going to be um, one of the problems we're having uh, in our debates uh, in the country is we're not sure exactly what the Founding Fathers were saying. You know, this is a success formula that they had. This, this what they put together, and we're going to talk, discuss it tonight. Now, it's going to get, you're, I'm going to try to talk slow, but yet we only have two hours. Now, the last one that we're going to do, number seven, is going to be restoring America. We may need two and a half to three hours on that, possibly. Uh, because I've got, the, I've got solutions to, to turn things around. And uh, that may take a little time. But we forgot what this says. Uh, it's very important to read things like this because then the Fed in the Federalist Papers it tells you what the Constitution means. Now I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Uh, we got more people coming in here so I'll, I'll slow up. This is very good. Um, this, this class is getting popular. Uh, I want you to read I want you to read Federalist 78 because then you'll understand what the judicial branch is supposed to be doing. Is that page? 78. Page. No, it's Federalists number 78. Oh, okay. Okay. 78. And uh, you'll understand what uh, uh, what the founders meant by the judiciary. It, we're way off course. All right. Now, uh, let's see, where's uh, Mary? We're going to need John Adams here in, in just a second. Uh, I want to show you John Adams. We're going to start off with this. Now, John Adams, some of the founding fathers had read his discourse uh, on the Constitution. They didn't like it. They didn't like, and, and, and some of them didn't like John Adams either. They thought he was, <coughs> he was, um, John Adams was very pushy. And he had a very strong opinion of what was right and wrong. And thank God we had him there. But um, I want to show you, uh, this is from the HBO special on John Adams. And I'm going to show you what he did when he got up and he talked about independence. This is the kind of spirit these men had, men and women. And this is what we need to reclaim in our country. This is what the kind of thing we've lost. The president recognizes Mr. Adams, Massachusetts. Objects of the most stupendous magnitude. Measures which will affect the lives of millions, born and unborn. Now before us. We must expect a great expense of blood to obtain them. But we must always remember that a free constitution of civil government cannot be purchased at too dear a rate as there is nothing on this side of Jerusalem of greater importance to mankind. My 
my worthy colleague from Pennsylvania spoken with great ingenuity and eloquence. He has given you a grim prognostication of our national future, but where he foresees apocalypse, I see hope. I see a new nation ready to take its place in the world. Not an empire, but a republic. But a republic of laws, not men. Gentlemen, we are in the very midst of revolution. The most complete, unexpected, and remarkable of any in the history of the world. How few of the human race have ever had an opportunity of choosing a system of government for themselves and their children. I am not without apprehensions, gentlemen. But the end we have in sight is more than worth all the means. believe, sirs, that the hour has come. My judgment approves this measure, and my whole heart is in it. All that I have, all that I am, and all that I hope in this life, I am now ready to stake upon it. While I live, let me have a country. A free country. This is John Adams uh, saying, basically, nobody's ever had this opportunity. He sees where John Dickinson, he was talking about John Dickinson, where John Dickinson sees apocalypse, he sees hope. And uh, he was willing to give his life for that. And many of the, these who signed the Declaration of Independence did it at great expense, great cost to their own lives, to their families. Um, we don't seem to have this right now. We need to have this. We need to have what John Adams had. John Adams was not popular. He was not a popular person. He said it like it was. We got Stu Sennett back there. Stu Sennett's like a... a uh, Modern day John Adams. <laughs> now I want to tell you something. The founders sat down in 1787 and they discussed a lot of things for four months. Uh, England had a chance to do it with Oliver Cromwell, they did not do it. Cromwell became a dictator and he became very unloved and unappreciated. Uh, however, we had Washington. That's different. We've never had anybody like that. I know that the country, uh, America today, uh, loves Lincoln. Lincoln is the man that everybody loves in America. But you have to have Washington. That's right. 
Because if you don't have Washington, you don't have Lincoln. See, Washington set the thing up, and he was, uh, there was nobody quite like him. He was the indispensable man. Well, the founders got together, and they pooled their ideas on what will work. And this is the part that we kind of miss in this whole discussion. Uh, a lot of people say, well, the found, the, what the founders did was outdated. As a matter of fact, the Constitution's outdated too. It, uh, it worked for an 18th century uh, civilization, society. It doesn't work anymore. Well, the reason they're saying that is because they don't understand uh, what was put in place. See, this was a success formula. And they don't understand all that went into putting this in place. For instance, they discussed Polybius, Cicero, Montesquieu, we're going to discuss them tonight, Blackstone, who's gone into the Ethernet. You, you talk about Blackstone to people, they they got a blank stare, they, they want to get a big gulp. Um, John Locke, we've got to discuss tonight. Adam Smith, we're going to discuss a little more. And the Bible. Founders were very big on the Bible, and they uh, extricated verses from the Bible to get balance of powers, to get property rights, and I'll talk to you where they got them from today. Um, Plato, the founders had discussed him, and they thought he was a complete crackpot, and they threw him out. They, they didn't, and I will read to you, I have for you tonight, um, Adams, Jefferson's, all their letters back to and forth to each other. I'm going to read you what they said about Plato tonight. I also have um, a third, I've got the other two thirds at home, of Madison and Jefferson's letters to each other, which all the young people in high school should be reading these. You want to get the history of America? Read Adams, Jeff Adams and Jefferson's letters and read uh, Madison and, Madison and Jefferson wrote each other 1,250 letters. Back and forth. One of the greatest friendships in the history of mankind. It was a 50-year friendship. And at the end of, uh, after uh, Jefferson passed away, Madison said, I can't, and he would say it. Madison spoke in a very erudite way. Uh, but what he was saying was, I can't remember ever having a quarrel with him in, in the 50 years. They just, they just had this kind of a friendship. Well, um, why do people act the way they do? Why do they act? What, what is the difference between burning the American flag and saluting the American flag? What's the difference? <clears throat> Why do some people burn it and other people salute it? Upbringing or lack of respect. Well, you, there's respect, but why do they have the respect or lack of respect? Understanding. Part of it's what it symbolizes to them. What it symbolizes to them uh, so what do we get? So what? What is that? Um, is that free speech? <laughs> well, you, we we have free speech here. You can't do this in Iran. No. Uh, but so why, why would they burn it? Why would they salute it? Now, Cloward has has an idea over there. Lack of education. Well, education is important. Th th that's part of it. Yeah. I think it has to do with how they're brought up, what they're taught when they're growing up. But some people grow out of what they're brought up. Beliefs. Believe. That's it. The difference, the difference between burning the American flag and saluting is beliefs. That's the difference. The one that salutes has a belief in, in what they believe in. The one that burns it believes something d different. Well, where would they get those beliefs from? Well, what's that? They just believe they'll burn a flag today? Well, but there's something they disbelieve, they don't like about the country. They're, they're burning the flag because there's something they don't like. There's something wrong there. Um, there's a whole there's a whole group of things, but there there's a dis discontent with the with the country. Now we've been um, teaching this. This has been through the system. We're 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 not uh, we're not teaching the greatness of America anymore. We're teaching all the flaws. Right. Look what we've done to, to the Indians. What, what did we do to the African Americans? What, we didn't give women the right to vote in 1787. Did you think they were going to do that? Did you really think that that was going to happen when the history of mankind 
uh, most places you don't even have the right to vote. Uh, I think we're taking a lot of things for granted here. Uh, they're also not coming clean here, besides not telling the greatness of America, they're also not telling some of the other dirty little secrets that really tip the balance, like uh, you know, the Irish that were enslaved and came to America as slaves, or again, yes. how many black people actually owned plantations and had slaves. Well, that's a good point, but if you tell that story, then that, that makes America a little, look a little bit better. So, but if you tell the, the wrong side of the story, then it doesn't look as good. And then you get people burning the flag. And then the Supreme Court on a 5-4 decision said it's, it's legal. It's legal to burn the flag. I was up in Washington State. It's illegal to burn your garbage. <laughs> the education the education is that the civil war was due to slavery, it was not due to slavery. Well, that's another that's another issue, and that that's that's true. Um, well, let's go on with this. So, what beliefs do you have, and what beliefs do these others have? Well, have they studied Polybius? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, you went into Seven Eleven the other day, and Polybius was there. <laughs> Well, who is that? Who is this guy? He was Greek, that's right. He was a Greek, but who was he? Was he a teacher of uh, Plato? He was what? He was one of Plato's contemporaries. No, he wasn't one of Plato's contemporaries. Aristotle. Um, here's, he lived from 204 to 122 BCE. Okay? He was a historian. He was a Greek historian. One of the greatest of all the Greek historians next to Herodotus and Thucydides. He had great debates in that time. Now remember, this is um, uh, 204 to 122 BCE. And at that time, there were great debates over monarchy, aristocracy, and pure democracy. Now, Greece was a pure, what is a pure democracy? The founders were very concerned about democracy. Pure democracy have no representatives. Yeah, yes, pure democracy is where you vote on everything. There's no really representative government. Everybody is, is voting on every issue. What's wrong with that system? The majority wins. Chaos. Well, majority winning is, is okay because we believe that. But you got not only chaos, but what else? Yep. You got people working for a living. You got everybody vote. Can you keep up with it? Can you keep up with all the issues right now? No. So we elect a representative. They go down to Salem. And they double cross us. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, they, but they keep up with all the issues. Try to. They're able to keep up with the. There are some very good ones that have iron rods up their spine, but there's not enough of them. So the majority, we believe in majority rule. So we minority has to speak, but the majority rules. That's why uh, in this restoring America, which we're going to teach the seventh lesson, uh, the filibuster in the Senate. That's got to be. We've got to do something about that. Uh, we can't have the majority, a super majority, having to vote and everything gets held up. That's, that's not the way we do things. That's not the way America was, was supposed to be. We have to look at that. And we'll talk about that then. Now let's go through uh, Thucydides. He admired the Roman Republic. He wrote 40 books of history. Now, you may not know who Polybius was, but the Founding Fathers knew who he was. They knew who he was, and they had studied him, and Polybius looked at three forms of government and knew that each of their own would degenerate if not controlled with checks and balances. How do you like that? He kind of figured this out. Now, he didn't have a judicial system in there. He had an executive. Uh, he had an upper house, um, and he had representative government. Uh, but he, he said monarchy would degenerate to tyranny, aristocracy would sink into oligarchy. What's oligarchy? Small group. Small group of people, like in the Soviet Union, they had the Politburo, small group of people run, run everything. That's an oligarchy. Um, and democracy would, or mob rule, would, uh, would uh, also degenerate into mobocracy. The founders uh, did not want a democracy. How do you like that? Woodrow Wilson came up and said, uh, uh, democracy, I'm going to save the United States for democracy. I don't want to save for democracy. I want a republic saved. And he ran on that in 1960. He ran on two things, save us for democracy 
and to um, also to keep us out of war. Both of those are no good because he broke the war promise. And I don't want to be a democracy, and neither did the Founding Fathers. They wrote about it in the Federalist Papers, and they said it's dangerous. And by the way, that word democracy is not in the Constitution. It's not in the Declaration of Independence. That's not our form of government. Um, Polybius felt that a monarchy had executive strength to lead administratively and in time of war. You got time of war, you got to have somebody uh, that can make decisions. Uh, to run the war. FDR in World War II ran that war and um, you need somebody to in your government to be able to make decisions like that. He met with Churchill a lot. They formulated things. He started out with Lend-Lease before we were even in the war. Now, you may not like every decision made by the executive, and that's where the legislature has to come in. But uh, you do need somebody. Uh, Polybius also said the democracy represented the vast population of people without which monarchy and aristocracy could not exist. He postulated that all three systems be combined into a mixed system of government, which he felt the Romans were starting to do. And he became very friendly with Rome, Roman Republic. However, after Polybius died, Rome became dictatorial with an emperor form of governing, which would be ruler's law. Polybius visualized the monarch as the executive, the aristocracy as a senate, and democracy represented in the popular assembly. Okay, that was his three parts that he envisioned, but he didn't have a judiciary. He didn't have a judicial system of government. Um, But that was the first three-part, three-department constitution in history without a judiciary. It will be so-called mixed constitution with three departments. Now, the idea of a three-part government or separation of powers died with Polybius until when? Who? Founding fathers read. No, no, no. It was before before the founders. Now, see, if you don't know this, then your children and their children are not going to know it either. But you may say, well, so what? They don't know it. I don't know it. Why is this important? It's important. Here's why this is important. Because, yes, Cloud. Who? It wasn't Locke. Who was the other one you said? Montesquieu. Montesquieu. Montesquieu, that's right. Montesquieu. But that was 1,800 years later. That's 1,800 years. Montesquieu put in the judiciary. And, the found, and why is that important? Because the founders were doing all this reading, see? And they were trying to put together a society, not a utopia. This is not utopia. If you're looking for utopia, it's not here. It's not where you give uh, somebody we got to take from the rich and give to the poor so that we can equalize everything. No, that's not. That doesn't work either. We've had that last week at socialism. It doesn't work. Uh, and if you're looking for utopia, it's not in this life. But if you're looking for an ordered society that can work, then that's what the founding fathers gave us. And how did they give it to us? They looked at Polybius. They said, boy, this, is, this guy was talking about this way back when. And then all of a sudden, before 1787, you had a man, an ge- absolute genius, Charles de Montesquieu. He wrote this book in 1748 called The Spirit of Laws. And it took him 20 years to write it. 20 years to write the book. He put this whole thing together and he said, this is the way a government should run. And the founders had read all the... That, that was an amazing thing. They had all read these things. And that's called the spirit of laws. And uh, has anybody taken a look at the spirit of laws here? It's quite a, a deep read. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not like reading Dr. Seuss, I can tell you that right now. 
Well, the founders had read this kind of stuff, and they said, this is the way to do this. Now, it was Jefferson who um, wrote to Madison in 1784 and said, I'm going to send you 200 books. He was in France. You know, he was a minister of France. He said, I'm going to send you 200 books, and this is how to put America together. And he got the book sent. It took him a few months to get it overseas. And guess what? Madison read every single one of them. And he prepared himself. It took him two years to read them. And by 1787, he was ready. He was all ready. See, that's how they, they, they studied it out. They thought things through. It wasn't just uh, willy-nilly and sound bites. This took, this took some real expertise to put this whole thing together. Well, all right, so that's Polybius. Now, Polybius is not on the front of our tongues. Is Cicero? <coughs> well, we got to have him, right? You got to have Cicero. Let's put him over here. And Cicero lived from 106 to 40 BCE, or you can say BCE, or some would say BC. BC is before the common era, of course. Um, he gave <laughs> us something very valuable. Now, here's a book on Cicero. Cicero was messing around with, uh, he wanted to know what the, um, what a really good constitution would be, what it would be made up with. And um, he studied law and philosophy in Roman Greece. He rose to be a Roman consul. And he was murdered in 43 by some of uh, Mark Anthony's henchmen. He was against the popular drift of the day. Of course. Let me tell you something. If you stand up for what's right, first of all, you, gotta, you have to figure out in your mind. You might say, well, what, what, what do you mean what's right? Well. There's two ways you can determine. A belief in God is important, but not everybody believes in God. But if you have a belief in God, you're going to be on the right track, because Cicero talked about this, and we'll talk about it. And then you have to have reason. That's right. Those two things. You and combine life. those two things, and you can kind of get what's right. And, and then when you get what's right, if you stand up for it in a day like we're in today, uh, you're, you're, um, if you're in a certain position, you may even get murdered. You may even be assassinated for standing up for what's right. You'll get down. It's what? You'll get slapped down. Or you'll get, normally you'll just get slapped down. But some people get murdered for standing up for what's right. Well, Cicero said, um, he wrote the landmark books, The Republic and the Laws. He envisioned a future society based on what? And that's the big thing of Cicero. What did he base his future society on? Who said that? Thank you very much. Natural law. Now, Clarence Thomas um, sat before the Senate Judiciary Committee and talked about natural law, and he got castigated for it. How can you believe something like that? That's terrible. What is natural law? That's what Cicero said he would base his society on. What is it? Well, it's the, roughly speaking, it's the... Uh, Thou shalt not kill. Yeah. All right, so so we don't do that. That's part of natural law, then, right? Yeah. All right. It's the Creator's order in the universe of things is called natural law. Now, this man here, Adam Smith, wrote this book. I showed it to you last week. We'll talk about him a little bit more tonight. We must talk a little bit more about him. But he wrote this book called The Wealth of Nations. <coughs> and he based his idea, economics is a very tough science. It's a very tough science. And he based his ideas on economics, uh, on natural law. He says that economic is a science that has a, a, a natural law to it. And he wrote a book right before this called the theory of moral sentiments. I brought it in, uh, for those of you who were here last week, I brought that in. 
and he based his ideas on morality. And there's an economic, there's a, mor, uh, there's a moral way to conduct the economy and economics. And, and Smith came out with his theory, and the founders picked up on it. It was, a, it was a theory at that time. Nobody had ever talked about it. And so uh, there's a natural law to everything, really. And this man is right. It's um, the creator's order in the universe of things. Now, God gives man the ability to reason. The, reason, the way you can... You don't reason because you created yourself to reason. You didn't give yourself your brain... Uh, the, the reason that you have is something that was created. And reason is a very important thing. You can reason things out. And the, in the Enlightenment, right before the Founding Fathers, in that period of time, they were talking about these kind of things. We're not talking about this anymore. We're talking about all kinds of other things. Like, should we have war with Iran? I mean, that, <laughs> that's our discussions now. Or who won the Tony Award? For the voice. So, um, God gives man the ability to reason and have common sense. What do you hear what John Locke said? Boy, I'm going to tell you, that was a great man. Have common sense by which to live and solve problems. That's how you, your everyday activities, you, you have a certain amount of common sense. You'd solve problems. You're reasoning these things out. You're using your God-given reason. The reasoning of the mind in its natural state will help determine right conduct with the Supreme Being. What's that? Uh, I want Cicero on. Yeah, I, I did want Cicero. That's right. Thank you. I've, I completely forgot that. Uh, but that's okay. You can get him on now. True law. Now listen to this. This is what Cicero said. Hey, listen. The founders had read Cicero. They said, let's put this... There, there he is. There's the great man. Um, he said that true law is right reason in agreement with nature. Unchanging and everlasting. And to tamper with its... Listen to this, what Cicero said. To tamper with its operations um, is a detriment and will corrupt the order of things. The term nature and nature's God was used by Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. It is a reflection of Cicero and John Locke's teachings. How do you like that? Now, when uh, Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, most of it was written on the first day. But most of it he he'd copied down from another treatise that he'd given on the rights of British Americans. He wrote that in 1774. Well, he took 16 more days. He was at Second and Market in Brick Building. He was in the upper floor. He's writing this out. And he was thinking about how he could present this through certain philosophies. And, of course, John Locke was in the center of all of this. You had Cicero, you had Locke, Blackstone, Montesquieu. Um... Cicero played an active role in Roman politics as a statesman and political philosopher. He wrote extensively about the importance of civic virtue. You can let, let me say something about this, civic virtue. It doesn't matter what documents are written. If the society does not have virtue in it, the society will eventually go. You got to, the first thing, if you, when you come to the uh, seventh, uh, this is the third, the seventh, uh, installment of this seminar uh, we're talking about restoring America the first thing it's not the budget it's not foreign affairs the first thing 
that our society must do is to rid itself of debauchery. That's the number one. Do that first, and these other things will flow out of it. And we'll talk about how we can do that uh, in that lesson. Um, he wrote extensively about the importance of civic virtue, the common good, and natural law. In On the Republic, he warns that the Republic, despite being far superior to all other governments, is being destroyed. Now, Rome was destroyed from within, wasn't it? Yes. That's how you can... Uh, America will not be destroyed from without. <coughs> Abraham Lincoln said, if this government is to be destroyed, it will be destroyed from within. Cicero blames the destruction on personal ambition, which was beginning to override the common good, especially among the ruling elite. Many of the ideas presented in On the Republic clearly demonstrate the profound effect Greek writers such as Plato and Aristotle had on Cicero's work. They did, but we, we don't uh, subscribe to Plato. So uh, he, he um, what we subscribe mostly and uniquely from Cicero is the natural law aspect of setting up a government. The founders called for a virtuous society like Cicero did. Benjamin Franklin said this, only people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. That's Benjamin Franklin. George Washington said this, he praised the American Constitution as the palladium of human rights, but also pointed out that it could survive only, quote, so long as there shall remain any virtue in the body of the people. I think we're getting into a period now where the country is becoming, uh, losing its virtue. And um, that's a danger sign. We had a president, he's on Mount Rushmore. His name was Theodore Roosevelt. I suggest everybody here read, read about Theodore Roosevelt. Now, Theodore Roosevelt was very American, very nationalistic. He's a, he's a great American. <laughs> However, um, he didn't. He looked at the Constitution differently. He was the first president, um, and this was a hundred years after Jefferson. Because when was uh, Theodore Roosevelt president? What year did he? Is one? Nineteen oh one. Nineteen oh one. Because McKinley was assassinated, right? right. So 1901 to 1909. Yeah. All right, so he served about seven and a half years, and he said he didn't want to run another term. He, he said, I, that was a terrible mistake I made. I should never have said that. But Jefferson's view of the Constitution was what? Direct interpretation. It was what? Direct interpretation. Direct, I can't, I'm sorry. A strict interpretation. Strict interpretation. He says, if the Constitution doesn't say you can do it, you can't do it. Right? Okay. What did, uh, 100 years later, Teddy Roosevelt got, was, became president. What was his interpretation of the Constitution? He flipped it. He flipped it on its head, didn't he? What did he say that it, uh, that it was? It wasn't in the Constitution. You can do it. Yeah. yeah, if it's not prohibited, Mel's right. If it wasn't prohibited, I can do it. See, he didn't... Um, what about the Tenth Amendment, though? Well, you got the Tenth Amendment that says that um, the states are, are the king. Uh, but you got to understand that Roosevelt had big ideas. And the Constitution got in the way. It's kind of a nuisance, actually. Uh, FDR was a big nuisance. Uh, FDR did some good things, but he did some very bad things, too. Uh, but to Theodore Roosevelt, the Constitution became a, a nuisance. Now, he was the first president, and the people, American people loved him. He was a very moral man, very good family man. The American people loved him. They loved his energy. They loved his, you know, um, uh, uh, speak softly, carry a, a big stick. Um, he was such a moral man, then how could he find the Constitution as being a big problem? Well, look, um, 
we all think differently. And he had terrible tragedy in his life that you or I or many people here probably haven't gone through where his wife and his mother died simultaneously on the same day. How, how do you live through that? How, do you, how does your life go on? So he went out to the Dakotas and he, he started a new life. Uh, he just didn't look at the Constitution the way uh, the previous presidents were looking at it. Um, and that started us on a different train. The Constitution it was not written. She was, and a lot of people say, well, it's outdated. It's not. A, what, if, what if McKinley hadn't been assassinated? Or what if he would have lived? Theodore Roosevelt would be a footnote. Because vice president in those days, you, you, you get, went there to die. Biden. Come on. You think it's what? Biden? Well, he's still living, isn't he? Um, hey, listen. It has nothing to do with being outdated. It has to do with us, with what we are, with what we believe. It's not outdated. Jefferson was right. Hey, he's an American icon. These are, these are icons you're talking about. Madison, Jefferson, Adams, Washington, Franklin. These are, these are American icons. They knew what they were doing. They're reading Cicero. They're reading Polybius. They're reading Montesquieu. Uh, I don't even think they're teaching it that much anymore. They're teaching some things that I believe personally are not good. The founders didn't know about DNA. They didn't know about airplanes or computers or Facebook. Thank goodness they didn't know about Facebook. <laughs> I want to tell you. <laughs> but, but let me tell you something. They knew about human nature and they knew about principles. Principles. Gail? One thing they are reading is the polls. I, the polls? Oh, you mean the politicians are reading the polls? Well, most of the people uh, that we elect nowadays are very good at electioneering. They're very good at their district. They, they know their districts. They know how to get elected. Uh, they know rules and regulations and all, but they're, they're really devoid on history. We're, we're finding that they're really, um, they're really lacking. Some of them have it, but uh, history has been twisted now, and it's been going on for a long time. So you're going to have to you're going to have to look deep. You're going to have to look at the original documentation to get it. John Adams said this: "Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other." Like the one we have now. Yeah. Like what? Well, we don't, uh, the uh, original idea was to have a constitutional democratic republic. See, I pledge allegiance to the flag to the republic, but there's different kinds of republics. China's a republic. <coughs> Soviet Union called themselves the, uh, a republic. Uh, there's, there's countries in Africa called themselves republic. But we, we were a different kind of a republic. Uh, we are no longer a constitutional democratic republic. We've moved away from that. And we've moved away from it because it's very comfortable to not only think you're taking from the rich and giving to the poor, it's also very comfortable to, to think that everybody could be equal in, in, their, um, in their goods. We're not equal in intelligence. We're not equal uh, in abilities. And we better start thinking this through. Uh, th this is a, this is a, a foreign uh, belief system. You can turn that light on. You don't have to turn it on. Oh, okay, okay, good. All right, good. All right, so, so you've got to have what John Adams said. You have to have a, um, <coughs> uh, a moral and a religious people. Otherwise, if you don't have that, let's say you're making a contract with somebody. And the person you're making a contract with across the table looks like they're moral, but they're not. 
Well, are they going to honor their contract? You got to have that in place, and it, and it works out internationally too. You can't make international agreements with a, with countries that uh, are dishonest. It's not going to work out. So you got to have you got to have that in place. Samuel Adams said this. Samuel Adams. <clears throat> Sam Adams was the father of the revolution. That was what they called him. He said, uh, and a lot of us have completely forgotten him, but he's the guy who years in advance was saying we're going to have to have a revolution. Uh, far ahead of everybody else. He was a great man. He said, the sum of all is, if we would most truly enjoy the gift of heaven, let us become a virtuous people. Then shall we both deserve and enjoy it, while on the other hand, if we are universally vicious and debauched in our manners, though the form of our constitution carries the face of the most exalted freedom, we shall in reality be the most abject slaves. How do you like that? Good. Way back in the se se middle 1700s, he was saying this. And he also was the one who said that um, leveling in our form of government is unconstitutional. What's leveling? Well, uh, England was, do, was leveling. What were they doing? England believed in leveling. Leveling is um, you're giving people money from the government to support them. And we have Social Security today. We're going we're to talk about that in the seventh, uh, Restoring America. Social Security or welfare? Well, Social Security in Sam Adams' idea would be unconstitutional. In his idea. Social Security would be unconstitutional, and I believe it is unconstitutional. We have to determine what is moral. And what Gail's saying is right, because I don't think uh, we have a good agreement on that now in our society. Uh, we have to figure out what that is. And my suggestion is we get the, the wisest people in our country to sit down for a few months and discuss the country where it's been, where it's going, what worked, why this doesn't work, and have that discussion before we lose everything. Because we, there's a lot of corrections that need to be made. And Gail's right about that. Uh, we've gone away from that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said this, virtue is not hereditary. It's not hereditary. Now, there were many religious founders. Benjamin Rush, who signed the Declaration of Independence, wrote a book on reading the Bible in schools, which, by the way, I'm going to tell you what the founders' religion was. We need to be teaching religion in schools. Uh, you're going to get mad. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Uh, nobody's thrown me out yet, but, but we need to be teaching that. And I'll tell you what religion we need to be teaching. That's how we find our moral Yeah, and I, and I will read you the Northwest Ordinance tonight. Make sure to remind me if I, if I, for some reason, don't get to it. But we will get to it. Religion in school, that's the, what religion? I'll tell you what religion. Just hold on to your hat. The founders believed in that. Okay, James Wilson. He signed the Constitution. He was, uh, first, uh, he was on the first Supreme Court of the United States of America. James Wilson was a great man. He was almost beaten to death after he spoke. He spoke at the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention. And they, uh, Pennsylvania, we weren't sure was going to ratify the Constitution. They, they finally did. He went out and they said, get, they wanted him to get up on a, a, a talk at, the, at this podium that they had constructed. He got up there and guess what happened? He got thrown down on the ground and these men stormed Wilson. They had big um, wooden, uh, what would you call them? Sticks. Sticks. Big wooden sticks. They were beating him to death. They almost killed him. And then some people cleared out the others, and, and he, he survived. So he, later he, died in, he later died in debtor's prison. I, I want to tell you something. These are great men, and he said this. He wrote the first law book in America. He based it on the divine law of the Bible, which Blackstone based his treatises on. Fisher Ames, you know who he was? Fisher Ames is the one that's really most responsible, even though Madison put it together, Fisher Ames is most responsible for the, for what? The First Amendment. 
And he was a congressman from Massachusetts. He wanted the Bible taught in all schools, which, by the way, we need to go back to that. Amen. We need to start teaching the Bible in the schools. Yeah. And um, the Bible is not a religion. It's, it's a historical book. You've got prophets in there. Um, you have stories in there. You have the Mosaic laws in there. The New Testament is the teachings of the Messiah. Yeah, we need to know about that. Well, then you had Elias Boudinot. Well, who the heck is he? <laughs> Some people say, well, I had that for lunch. <laughs> I had a Boudinot. I, I put cheese on it. <laughs> well, what, how, how do you spell Boudinot? He, this is a great man. You never heard of him? Okay, here's Boudinot. B. O-U-D-I-N-O-T. Boudinot. It's a French name. He signed the Treaty of Peace with Great Britain in 1783, which was a big deal, by the way. Benjamin Franklin signed that. He helped frame the Bill of Rights. He was one of the presidents of the Continental Congress. How do you like that? He was the first president of the American Bible Society. Elias Boudinot. B O U D I N O T. Um, now, when was the first Bible printed in America? As a T usually is. Oh, here's what I wanted to ask you. Who was um, the one who handed the uh, took the sword from George Washington when he presented it? Uh, I, I guess it was Annapolis, and he walked out the door. And he, and he left power on the table. But he took his sword out, he unsheathed it, and we'll talk about, uh, I guess we got Washington next week, Washington Creates America. He unsheathed the sword, it was a packed gallery. Just packed, they wondered, is Washington gonna be king? He unsheathed his sword, and he gave it to somebody, and he walked out. Who did he give it to? Thomas Mifflin, who was the president of the Continental Congress. And see, Elias Boudinot was president of the Continental Congress another year. I know you've never heard of him, but he's one of our founding fathers. There's about 250 founding fathers. It wasn't just about five or six. Well, uh, my question to you is, where, when was the first Bible printed in America? Well, September 12th, 1782. By unanimous vote of Congress, they printed the Bible. That was a Continental Congress. Patrick Henry said this, <clears throat> the Bible is a book worth more than all the other books ever written. It took a lot to get the Bible. I, I have a, um, <coughs> a lecture, a two hour lecture called The Origin of the Bible. And it's an amazing story how we got the Bible. Well, the Founders' religious beliefs were based on self-evident truths. And Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter to Ezra Stiles, the president of Yale. Because Ezra Stiles said, what, what, uh, what is your religion? What do you believe in? And then he said, here's my creed. And this was the creed that the Founding Fathers believed in. And I'm going to tell you, this is the religion that needs to be taught in schools. All right? First, now I, I don't think you should teach Methodism or Presbyterianism or Catholicism or Mormonism or Judaism. I don't think that should be the religion that you're teaching. You can teach all of them. You can have a class on comparative religions. But I don't think you teach a religion. I think you teach what I'm going to tell you right now. And that's what they were teaching. Franklin says, I believe in one God, the creator of the universe. Okay? Teach that in school. Number two, he governs by his providence. Number three, he ought to be worshipped. Four, the most acceptable service we render to him is in doing good to his other children. Well, that makes sense. That's a, that's a good, good thing. 
Number five, the soul of man is immortal. Number six, the soul of man will be treated with justice in another life, respecting its conduct in this life. Now, this is the letter that he's writing back to Ezra Stiles, president of uh, Yale University. And then Franklin said this, this I take to be the fundamental points in all sound religion. Well, what I just read, most of the major religions of the day believe in that. All those things. Now, what was he talking about sound religion? The founders said we believe in sound religion. What is unsound religion? They didn't believe atheism was sound. They thought that was unsound. And John Locke talked about that, and I'll talk to you about it tonight, that he thought um, atheism was irrational. He thought it was irrational, and he, he came to that conclusion by thinking about it. And I'll tell you how he came to the conclusion. Now, Sam Adams, again, was quoted, and he says this, The religion of America is the religion of all mankind. How do you like that? Then, uh, John Adams said, the, great, the general principles on which America has been founded is what those principles I just read that Franklin said to Ezra Stiles. Thomas Jefferson, <clears throat> these are the principles in which God has united us all. How do you like that? Now, I'm going to show you something. Or actually, I'm going to read something to you. This is from the Founders Constitution. There are six volumes of this. The University of Chicago scholars got together and wrote all the documents and what it all means and they put it together in, in six volumes and if you're going to get this I suggest you get the paperback <laughs> because you'll go bankrupt if you get the hard copy <laughs> well in here is the Northwest Ordinance and what's that? well uh, we had all these lands in the Northwest Territory, they were territories, and we, we wrote up a Northwest Ordinance to govern those lands, and we did it just before we signed it in July 1787, just before the Constitution was, Constitution was being discussed at that time. You said no place could be, um, couldn't have slavery in any of the new territories. Yeah, couldn't have slavery in any of the new territories. Uh, by the way, what's that? And schools would be set up. Schools would. set aside property for that. That's right, schools in would be set up. Township. That's right. Um, the founders were against slavery. So you're going to say, well, why did we have it? Well, because the southerners. We had it because, yes. Thomas Jefferson said that slavery is like holding a wolf by the ears. He did say that. That was, that was, you couldn't let it go. Yeah. But you don't dare let go. Yeah, that's right. He said that afterwards, though. <laughs> uh, he's right. He's right. We need more young people like that. Because you see, you have to save the republic now. Your generation is the one has got to save it. Um, the Northwest Ordinance, in the third article of the Northwest Ordinance, this is what they wanted taught in the schools. Now listen to this. This is how far we've come away from where we were. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. The utmost good faith shall always be observed towards the Indians. Well, and then it goes on. Uh, we had some, some problems there. But that's what they wanted taught. Religion, morality, and knowledge. Well, who's religion? the one I just told you about. That's not somebody's religion. Those are general statements that are, that are made by most sound religions. And so what we've done now, we got the Supreme Court said, well, yeah, but we've got to have a wall of separation. And guess who said that? That wall of separation, church and state? That was uh, Justice Black That's right. said that. 
And um, I think he was in. I think he was in the Ku Klux Klan at one time. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, he also hated blacks, uh, Jews, and Catholics. That was well, that's Ku Klux Klan. Um, he said we got to have a high wall. The founders wanted a very high wall, and they wanted the separation. Well, they, they didn't want that. We got a First Amendment. That's sophistry. That's why the executive, this president of the United States, has to look at that in 1947, should have done that, and said, right. look, uh, that decision is not constitutional. We're not going to execute what you just did. Can the president do that? You're darn right he can do it. Do the presidents do it? No. See, because the Supreme Court is giving an opinion. They don't have any enforcement. The enforcement is you and me. We've allowed that to happen. We've given them the enforcement power, but they don't have any enforcement power. It's the executive that enforces. The legislature could overturn it too. Well, anyway. <clears throat> That's the kind of religion that God has united us in all. So we need to teach religion, morality, and knowledge. That's what school children should be getting. They're not getting that now. And we're producing, I don't know what we're producing, but it's not, uh, Idiots. It's not all that comfortable. <laughs> Idiots. Idiots. Um, there's some smart, there's some very smart young people too. Useful. Gail, I think you had a question, then Dave had a question. No, David. Um, David. I remember it's Leonard or someone that said, giving your children four years and have them for a lifetime. Yeah. And so if we teach these children all these they had a They had a special school in Frankfurt, Germany, where they devised plans. I've got their plans at home. They devised plans to overthrow a culture. And uh, have you read The Naked Communist? Yeah. It's pretty chilling. But I would suggest everybody read Tragedy and Hope. It'll take you the rest of your life to do it. There's Montesquieu. Mr. Frank. Where's a good looking guy, isn't he? Oh, yeah. 1689 to 1755. Uh, Montesquieu is where we get the separation of powers from. Now, this is 1800 years after Polybius. <clears throat> and um, he inherited a huge fortune a title of nobility, and a judicial office from his uncle at 24 years old. Spent 20 years of amazing research on history and philosophy, and took two uninterrupted years of study to produce his landmark book, Spirit of Laws, which I've talked about in 1748. The book certainly ranks with the great books of all time, and certainly the greatest book of the French 18th century. Uh, he felt that England was the closest to moving in the direction of separation of powers. Now, instead of reading uh, what he said, I want to talk a little bit about, about a Montesquieu. How many people are, are required to read the Spirit of Laws anymore? What? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many people have even heard of the Spirit of Laws, let alone read it. I've never heard of it. Well, this is the book that my, this, the founders read it. See, you, you haven't heard of it, but they read it. So how many do you think have read it today? Or even parts of it? All the students that graduate from Hillsdale College have read it. That's a good school. Hillsdale College, they're giving, they're talking about the Federalist Papers now. Have you been going through their? I'm taking that too. They're very good. Hillsdale is teaching, uh, doing a, a great service to the public, but they're one little school. Yeah. And um, generally speaking, uh, you're not required to read Montesquieu. No. Uh, Montesquieu um, knew, knew about Polybius, and he put this all together, and the founders took a look at Montesquieu and said, this is the way to go. <coughs> you have to separate power. <coughs> you can't have power in one person. Uh, and we'll talk, let's see, in this book, Origins of American Constitutionalism. This is a pretty good book by Donald Lutz. Uh, it tells you 
who the founders were talking about and what percentages. He breaks it down in percentages. 34% of the discussion from 1860, excuse me, from 1760 to 1805 in the major documents, 34% of it had to do with the Bible. And the title again, please? The Origins of American Constitutionalism by Donald Lutz. How do you like that? 34% of the discussion about the Bible. No, they weren't atheists. <laughs> they were very, very... Uh, and I have a whole book. They, they say, well, yeah, but Washington was a deist. No. I have a book called um, Sacred Fire. It's this thing on Washington. I'll use it next, you'll see it next week. Uh, his religious beliefs. When Braddock was killed, General Braddock was killed at Monongahela, uh, Washington gave the eulogy at that ceremony. Um, and part of the eulogy was, um, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's Washington. Washington gave that eulogy. It's in the book. It's in the Psalms. Yeah. Well, um, the founders had read Montesquieu and they, see, they had kind of a, a soup. They were putting in the ingredients of the soup and they had a little bit of Montesquieu, a little bit of Polybius, a little bit of Cicero, and then they had this man, Blackstone. Who's he? Sir William. He says, what? Law? Yeah. Law. He was a jurist. He lived from 1723 to 1780. English jurist who wrote on law. He was educated at Oxford. He became a professor of law there. He was elected to Parliament. And he said that law operates on natural laws of our maker. And he wrote a legal system based on that. See, these men around the Enlightenment, you had Smith was doing natural law and economics. Blackstone was doing it in law. You had Cicero talking, Cicero way before then, of course, was talking about Things were based on natural law. Uh, you had John Locke came up. Oh, I tell you, that was a great man. He was talking about if you don't base it on um, God, if you don't base your laws on God, uh, you're not going to have any laws. Well, uh, Blackstone believed that any statute is null and void if it violates the laws of nature or nature's God. How do you like that? He wrote the Commentaries on the Laws of England. There's four volumes. He wrote that in 1765. And the founders quoted him many times. And let me tell you about these four volumes. One day in 17, or excuse me, in the 1840s, a man came to a, a, a man who owned a small business, a small store, general store, and uh, the store owner was a very poor businessman. And this man came in and he bought some clothing and some other items, dry goods. And he said, the only thing I have is this barrel. There's some stuff in the barrel, but that's, I don't have any money. So this poor businessman said, okay, I'll take the barrel. And this, this, this poor businessman went out of business two years later. His, his business went bankrupt. But he said, what? he says, I wonder what's in that barrel. And he took the barrel, and there were some blankets in there, and he took the blankets out, and underneath the blankets, because he was wondering why the barrel was so heavy, <laughs> underneath the blankets were these four volumes of Blackstone. How do you like that? And he says, wow, I'm going to read this. He read all four volumes, and then became President of the United States. Yeah. Was Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> See, that's a story you've never heard. That story is in a book called The Unknown Lincoln by Dale Carnegie. He wrote it in 1932. Well, Blackstone's an important figure, and uh, in 1799, Supreme Court Justice James Iredell who was from North Carolina, said that for near 30 years, Blackstone's commentaries 
has been the manual of almost every student of law in the United States. And its uncommon excellence has also introduced it into the libraries and often to the favorite readings of private gentlemen. How they like that? They were all reading Blackstone in law school. I don't know if we're doing that now. <laughs> he does what? <laughs> well, um, you have to believe in this kind of stuff. Uh, that's why in the beginning of this lesson I said, what's the difference of burning the American flag and saluting it? The difference is beliefs. What do you believe in? Well, um, that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> but uh, I can tell you that um, we need to go back to Blackstone. Yeah. Now we're going to get into, Mary, let's go to John Locke. Let's go to this great man. The founders discussed Locke. Now, we got this soup now. So you got Blackstone in the soup. You got Cicero's in the soup. We're mixing it up. We got Montesquieu is in the soup. Um, we have um, Adam Smith is in that soup. We're mixing the whole thing up. And now we got, um, oh, Polybius in that soup. Now we got John Locke. Now let me tell you something. I'm disgusted and enraged at these people that are talking about the Founding Fathers as hypocrites and uh, money grubbers and property owners and all that. So what if they own property? Do you want to own property? You bet. Lots of it. And lots of it, as much as you can. This, this, is, this is insanity. We, we've just completely thrown all this out. That they, These men did something that nobody else has done. And they did it collectively. It wasn't just one person. It was a lot of people. And the reason we've thrown it out is because in the age we're living in now, we want everything immediately. That's right. See, that's why we want to fight. We want the Supreme Court to make a decision. We don't want to wait. Instant gratification. We want everything instant gratification. Well, I also get the impression that a lot, a lot of these people are passing on these laws. They don't believe in personal property. Yeah, that's good. They don't believe that you should have personal well, property. Well, we're going to talk. We're going to talk. This is a great point, and we're going to talk about what that means, what that means to a society. And John Locke talked about this. Now, he was an English philosopher. He's a physician. He combined his medical observations with political experiences to develop ideas about human nature and government. Now, I talked about Al Algernon Sidney a couple times ago. The founders put him in that soup that we're talking about. Algernon Sidney said that um, in, in um, 1683, he said that uh, if a government is doing things that are abusive and wrong, you have a God-given right to overthrow it. Yeah. That's what the founders said later. And this man was saying the same thing. Guess So uh, Algernon Sidney was beheaded. So he get, went to another country. <laughs> he got out. He said, no, I'm not gonna, I don't want to be beheaded. So he, he left for the Netherlands. Well, he said that... Um, he explained his ideas in the most famous work, Two Treatises of Civil Government. He also had, uh, this is very important, that you read Concerning Human Understanding by John Locke. He said, in the meantime, it is overvaluing ourselves to reduce all to the narrow measure of our capacities and to conclude that all things impossible to be done, whose manner of doing exceeds our comprehension, this is to make our comprehension infinite or God finite, where what we can do is limited to what we can conceive of. That's the way Locke was talking. See, we have finite minds. We can't, we do not, we can only go to a certain point and that's it. So you have to lean on something greater than yourself. Well, um, he was a theologian, he was an educator, a diplomat, son of an English, English gentry. Now let me um, say some more things about this. First of all, I want to ask you a question. Did you talk to your brain this morning? 
You talk to your brain every morning? Okay, does everybody do that? Okay, John Locke said you need to talk to your brain. You don't agree with your brain? You may get another brain. Uh, he said uh, you need to get up and talk to your brain. Good morning, brain. Uh, and th this is a <laughs> Good morning, brain. Uh, this is what he said. He said, I'm going to prove mentally that there's a God. And here's how I'm going to do it. He said, a clock has wheels, cogs, sprockets, and springs. A clock. Can you see that clock over there? It's got wheels and cogs and springs and so forth. Even with the forces of galaxies expanding, stars exploding, this is John Locke now, volcanoes erupting, and the North Sea surging, these occurrences cannot produce a clock. Okay? This is the way Locke is thinking. He's thinking it through. He said all of these tremendous occurrences can't produce a clock. Then he went further. There's a cogitative and non-cogitative beings. What's a cogitative being? A thinker. Something that can think. You and I, although sometimes we don't think very clearly, <laughs> but you and I can think. That rock on the ground, I can't think. That's non-cogitative. Doesn't think. Right? Okay. He says, only an intelligent, a cogitative being of some sort can create that clock. Put it together. Just because the volcanoes couldn't do it. The North Sea surging couldn't do it. Galaxies exploding couldn't do it. Then he, then he said this. He went further. He said, you see that rock over there? That's non-cogitative, doesn't think. He says, you see me? I'm cogitative. I think. Therefore, cogitative being made me. How do you like that? That's the way he was thinking. Therefore, there's a God. Had to have an intelligent being create me. Because I, I can think. So it had to be a thinking being, see? Well, the eye has about 500 parts to it. If one part is missing, you're blind. And that's the way Locke was. And he said that um, atheism is irrational because when you talk to your brain, so you need to get up and talk. He talked to his brain and his brain didn't answer this morning. Yeah. So he oh, it did answer and you didn't like what it said or whatever. Uh, but when you talk to your brain, atheism doesn't make any sense. And that's the way Locke was. And see, the founders put him into the stew. We don't talk much about Locke anymore. But he's a major cog. Now... Well, we need to change that. Yeah. We need to change it. We need to talk about them in a positive way. Adam Smith, we talked about last week. And, um, gee, what I wanted to do, I, I guess I'm not going to do, I showed a film last week, and I wanted to show um, Milton Friedman and uh, Donahue, yeah, which is on the... I did show it last week, but, I, but some people weren't here. But we, we'll, we'll hold off on that. Let's just talk about Smith for a minute. Um, who's Adam Smith? Who is he? He wrote The Wealth of Nations. Where is he from? He's Scottish. Scottish. He's a Scotsman. Never did get married. Uh, but he was a brilliant man. And he, um, he believed very highly. <laughs> <laughs> It takes an Iowa. <laughs> uh, he believed um, in, the, in free enterprise in the private market. As a matter of fact, he taught at the University of Glasgow. Not in Edinburgh. 
Now, in the University of Glasgow, the students would come and pay for the, for the privilege of being in the class. See, we don't charge anything for this. This is a free seminar. We do all of them for free. We don't charge. If you want to donate for chocolate chip cookies, you can do that. So we, we have to go by market principles. We have to figure if people come, they come. But what Adam Smith did was he said, okay, I am not going to teach for a government university because I believe, he believed that if he did that, that he wouldn't be doing it based on his efficiency. So he went and taught at Glasgow where people would come and they'd have to give money to hear him teach. And guess what? His classes were packed. He made a pretty good living. Well, uh, in those days, in those days, you had, uh, what was the reigning economic thought in those days? It was what? Mercantilism. It was mercantilism. And what is that? <laughs> Excuse me. What's mercantilism? Well, uh, the nation protects itself from massive imports through tariffs and duties, but still wants a high level of exports. Okay, I was in France one time with my wife, and uh, it was in uh, the uh, 1990s. And I said to my wife, uh, do you, what do you see on the street here? And she says, a bunch of cars. I said, yeah. Well, what, what do you see about them? He says, she says, I don't know. What's the difference? <laughs> I like my wife, but she, she's pretty blunt. I said, well, let me tell you what, the, what we're looking at. Every one of those cars on the street are French. There's no American, there's no, no other car. Well, she says, well, why does that matter? I said, that matters because you and I just paid $25 for a Perrier and a ham sandwich. No. Well, yeah, but that's just because it was expensive. I said, no, that's because this country is protecting their industries with high tariffs and the people living in the country are paying those tariffs. Yeah. That's not the way to conduct economic relations. Free up those markets. Make it free. Let everybody compete. So what if you're paying dumps of uh, uh, computer chips on the market? Do you benefit? Now, the computer, in, Intel doesn't benefit. And so they have to link themselves in with government to have higher tariffs to keep those chips out so that they benefit. But that's wrong. We're not, I'm not interested in the producers, I'm interested in the consumers. The argument against free trade, complete free trade, where you don't have any tariffs at all, and letting goods in your country, the argument is, yeah, but, but these other countries don't do that. So we shouldn't do that because we'll get burned. Well, what do you care if the other countries bring in goods that their government's paying for? They're subsidizing it. And anyway, the way to do things is for America to become a great moral force and a great example. Not to force, not to go over into different countries and try to build their nations up and nation build. That's not the way we should be doing this. We should be doing it based upon other countries looking at us and saying, wow, how did you do that? Could you let us know how this works over here? Because we don't, we don't know. Um, let me read you something. Oh, I need to tell you uh, four things that uh, Adam Smith said in The Wealth of Nations. Then I want to read you some more Adam Smith. There's four things that um, the government should do, the national government, which would be federal government. Four things they should do, which they really are not doing. The federal government is doing everything they shouldn't be doing, and they're not doing what they should be doing. And what are the four things that Adam Smith said that the federal government should be guarding against? Infringing on the rights of the state. <clears throat> well, that's true. They do infringe on the rights of the states. That's one of the things that they shouldn't be doing, but that's in the Constitution. One of the things that Adam Smith said was they should guard against illegal force. If the mafia comes in, you can't have that. That's a role of the national government. Another thing is fraud, misrepresentation of an item. National government has to take care of that. The third thing is monopoly. National government should be eliminated. We shouldn't be having monopolies, monopolies. But what's happening is that businessmen who are saying that they're serving you are getting in league with the government 
and forming monopolies. You got great tariffs on steel. You got the uh, what's that? The ethanol and uh, the, poor. I hate to pick on Mel, but uh, those those Iowans. You you got those uh, protections on ethanol uh, and special privileges. That's what causes monopolies. But I would say that most of the monopolies now that are being formed are not being formed privately. They're being formed with government assistance. We got to stop that. That's, that's harmful. And I want to tell you that Adam Smith said uh, these businessmen who act philanthropic are doing the opposite. They're saying it's for the public good, but no, it's not. It's for them. Okay? They, he called it, he says they're affecting uh, trade, but they're not. Walmart is a good thing. Uh, it has been ravaged and savaged by the media and by others that think it's a bad thing because they're treating their workers poorly. Look, if the workers are being treated poorly, they leave. They'll leave. If they're not, they stay. Um, I've been Walmart a lot. I like Walmarts. If, they, if, if you want unions, you can vote on the union. You have the opportunity to do that. If the, if the employees like what's happening, they'll vote against the union. They had a chance in the Ashland Co-op to vote for a union. They voted against it. They were concerned about it. That's a right. You have a right to do that. As far as Walmart goes, we need more Walmarts, not less. We need, the American people need low prices, an abundance of goods that are cheap, but they, they work properly. They're good. But the American people will ferret that out. Give them the chance and the freedom, look, you go to the store, why'd you go and buy a thing of milk at Albertsons? I went through this the other week. You went and bought that milk because you thought it was good, you thought it was a low price, and you benefited from it. And Albertsons benefited from it too because you bought it from them. We need to have the exchanges, very little government inter intervention. They have no business in economic, dis and I want to tell you something. I am disgusted at the presidential um, debates where the president say, well, I'm going to do this for the economy. I'm going to do Forget about you doing anything. You've got no business in the economy. First of all, stay out of the economy. Let the economy run itself. The American people are smart enough to make a decision. I can make it my own decision if I want to go in and get a grilled cheese sandwich where I want to go get it. And if I go get a grilled cheese sandwich at a certain restaurant and it's no good, I'm not going to go back there. they got to have the quality's got to be to match the price and to match the ability for me to go in and do it, okay? Uh, John Maynard Keynes was a genius. However, being a genius is not enough. Um, there's some people that are educated way beyond their intelligence. Uh, Keynes, uh, Keynes came along at a time where economies were starting to, to we, had, uh, we had a depression, actually, a very bad depression, and people were looking for answers because they thought capitalism caused the depression, but it turns out that it wasn't capitalism that caused the depression. Matter of fact, I give a whole class on how the depression was caused. I asked my father when I was five years old, the only intelligent question I ever asked when I was a child. The rest of them you can throw all out. But I, one day I, I must have been, I, I don't know, I, I must have had a, a thought and I said, Dad, what caused the Depression? He said, well, because my father lived through the Depression, he said the stock market crashed. And they set up That's not what caused it. There's a very specific reason why the Depression was caused, and the American people would be outraged if they knew the whole story. It's a very sordid story. Uh, but it has to do with government intervention. That's right. Yeah. In the early 1900s, we had horse and buggies delivering ice and other things to homes, milk, and so forth. Then along came a guy named Henry Ford, and we had the car. All of those people that were on the horse and buggy delivering the ice man, they went out of business. Was that good or bad that Henry Ford came along? Because you had unemployment, you had unemployment on the other end, see? But was that a good thing or a bad thing? It was a good thing. So because when you have advancements in society, you're going to have unemployment. But then those people get other jobs when you have this society moving. Um, the, 
the myth is that we're afraid, we think it's a zero-sum game. It's not a zero-sum game. It's a, it's a very active uh, thing. And Adam Smith said that um, you must, the national government must stamp out debauchery. That's a, that's a job it has to do. And we're not doing that. Debauchery. Debauchery is the, um, the vices. But it takes moral people to do that. We don't have a moral government. Well, uh, to have a moral government, you have to have a certain amount of in the populace that are moral to. Look, we got to stop complaining about the elected officials because we're the ones electing them. So we got, there's something that's got to change. And I believe education has to change. Um, Question. Joe? Yes. Um, on interference by government, what about the bailout of the banks? Well, let, let, let me go into that just a little bit. She asked about the bailout of the banks. Um, the federal government has no business in banks. We started doing this in the 1930s. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a failure formula. Let me tell you about Ronald Reagan for a minute. I know you all like Reagan. I did too. I voted for him twice. But let me tell you about Reagan. You have a cross between politics and truth. Okay? In order, I was telling somebody tonight that um, they're a very good person, they've got great ideas, but I said, you're not going to get elected if you present your ideas like you're presenting them. So if you want to present your ideas and make some kind of changes, you're going to have to present these ideas in a different way. Well, Reagan was against Chrysler being bailed out. Remember this? Yeah. It was 1979. Remember Chrysler was going to be bailed out yeah. by the federal government. And who was the head of Chrysler? Lee yeah. Okay, Lee Iacocca. And everybody and the press just loved Iacocca. He was a, but, he, but instead of promoting Chrysler, he was going to the halls of Washington, D.C. to get money to bail him out. Yeah. That's what he was doing. Okay, so Re now, of course, Chrysler was in Michigan, and Reagan was running against Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Michigan is a very tough state if you're running as a Republican. It's a tough state to win. He went over there. Now, I'm, I'm bringing this up a la Adam Smith and economics and the way things should work, but how politics gets involved in it. He was against the bailout of Chrysler. He went to um, Michigan and he met with Chrysler in a big meeting. I don't know if all of you remember this. He went in there, and it was, on, it was a, part of this was snipped by uh, the news media. And Lee Iacocca and all the workers there from Chrysler were very upset with Reagan because they're going to lose their jobs. If he has his way, they're going under because he doesn't want to bail Chrysler out. He's against it. And of course, this man, uh, you all need to read this book, you know. You should read the book and watch the 10 part series. You can Google it. You'll learn a lot about economics if you do that. If you don't do that, you'll die not knowing anything about economics. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> so he goes in, and Lee Iacocca says to him, and he's in front of all these Chrysler workers, well, we understand that you don't want to bail us out. Okay, now what are you going to say? You're running for president of the United States. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? I want to know what you're going to You want to be elected president of the United States. I want to know what you're going to do. Because you're the same ones that are talking about this country believing in slaves. But you would have voted for the Constitution, wouldn't you? Would you have signed it? Yeah, you would have signed it. So that means that you would have had slavery. I want all these people that are disgusted with the founding fathers because of slavery, which they don't know what happened there. Would you have signed the country? Yeah, you would have signed it. Well, then you were for slavery. Because that's what you had. You had to make a compromise. They compromised. They compromised. They were, nine of the 12 states were against slavery. They wanted it abolished. But they couldn't get the job done if they had abolished it. Because North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia would have walked out. And then you have no constitution. And then you have no country. 
Then you got anarchy. All right, so your pres your president, your uh, your candidate Reagan. You go to Chrysler. You're against the bailout on principled reasons. You don't think the government should be involved in bailing out major corporations. Lee Iacocca says, "Hey, we understand that you're um, you're for not bailing us out. What do you say about that? Now you're running for president. You need votes. You got to get Michigan. What do you say? You stick with your what do you say to keep your?" Pre well, if you stick with your principles, you're going to lose all, all their votes and you'll lose Michigan, too. But you've got other principles that are in play that you want to um, accentuate You want to accentuate, and you want to put in practice. What would you have answered? And I'll tell you what he said. He gave the right answer, by the way, I think. You could, you could, you could uh, scold Iacocca, but that's not going to help you much because no, he's not going to do that. He can't do that. He no. He went to the federal government to get the bailout. He, he did. There was something wrong with the management style, or something wrong with Chrysler. Their pensions were too high. The management style wasn't good. They were being outcompeted by foreign cars. There was a whole group of things that were wrong, and and so Iacocca, he just went to the federal government to get to get bailed out. What the, I'll tell you what Reagan said. And he was excellent in doing it. Now, you, may, you and I may not have said this. He said, the federal government is responsible for your situation. And he said it just like this, too, the way I'm telling you. The federal government is responsible for where you are, and the federal government should bail you out. Oh, the whole room lit up and said, oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and he won Michigan. Now, you may have said, well, that was on principle. Well, maybe it was, but you know what? He was president for eight years, and he did some very principled things. That's that's pol but that's politics. So tie that into that's the banks. That's politics. Now. now tie that into the banks. Well, the banks should not be bailed out by the federal government because that's not a responsibility of the federal government. The federal they're being regulated. They're being, and that's all started in the '30s and even before that. If you're one of the Chrysler workers, <coughs> and you think that if he gets elected president, you're going to lose your job, you're probably not going to vote for him. Uh, it's a, look, politics is a tough game, and we got the, we got the general public now. You're going to have to educate. And you can do it. We can do it, and I think you're going to get, I think you're going to get somebody that will help educate the American people. I have a feeling. Now, let me, let me just uh, read you some things. Um, this is uh, Milton Friedman's Free to Choose. And I want to read you some things from what Adam Smith said that Milton Friedman talked about. <coughs> this is a chapter called The Tyranny of Controls. Okay? Now, when you Google free to choose, you can find this on there. And there's 10 uh, installments of a program that PBS put on in 1979 called Free to Choose. 30 minutes of it is a kind of video presentation and 30 minutes of it is a roundtable discussion. It's all on YouTube. It's excellent. YouTube. It's on YouTube, yeah. It's excellent for anybody. I've watched it many times. And you have to watch it and think about it carefully, what's being said. Uh, here's what, here's what um, Adam Smith said in discussing tariffs and restrictions, which we're discussing right now. What is prudence in the conduct of every private family can scarce be folly in that of a great kingdom. If a foreign country can supply us with a commodity cheaper than we ourselves can make it, better buy of it of them with some part of the produce of our own industry, employed in a way in which we have some advantage. In every country, <clears throat> it always is and must be the interest of the great body of the people to buy whatever they want of those who sell it cheapest. Now let me go on. They weren't thinking that way in the 18th, middle 18th century. This is not what they were thinking about. They were dealing with mercantilism. The proposition is so very manifest. It's self-evident. See, the proposition is self-evident. They put that in. Franklin had Thomas Jefferson change uh, uh, sacred and immutable 
we hold these truths to be sacred and immutable. They had that scratch and Franklin said, why don't you put self-evident? That's more of a scientific term. People understand that. We don't know what self-evident is anymore. We're calling the moon the sun. We're calling the day the night. Uh, self-evident doesn't mean anything anymore. Well, here's what Smith says. He says, the proposition is so very manifest that it seems ridiculous to take any pains to prove it, that you should buy the cheapest thing that, that you want. And, more, and the most abundance, that's a good product. Nor could it ever have been called in question had not, now listen, listen carefully to this. It seems ridiculous to, uh, to take any pains to prove it, nor could it ever have been called in question had not the interested sophistry of merchants and manufacturers confounded the common sense of mankind, and I'll tell you how they've done that, their interest is, in this respect, directly opposite to that of the great body of the people. So what they say, they go before Congress and say, look, this is for the public good. We need to do this for the public good. It's not for the public good. They say it's for the public good, but it isn't. It's for their good. The public good is served best when you, as consumers, get the best deal possible. And you're not going to get that best deal possible if we have government of, uh, uh, interference on all levels, whether it's tariffs, whether it's um, uh, subsidies. Uh, this is all, you've got corporate welfare. No, you know, you compl people complain about uh, the welfare state. We've got, we're giving out all of these uh, various uh, entitlements. How about corporate welfare? How about that? That's got to be cut out. That's no good either. We're giving welfare to foreign countries. We shouldn't be doing that. Well, that's a, that's a whole another uh, topic uh, that doesn't make sense to build a road in Uganda when we got potholes in our roads here. What are we doing? And we're doing this through the World Bank and the IMF. All of those inner arrangements need to be looked at. They were World War II. After World War II, we started getting international, giving money away, all of those things. That's what I told you. You need these wise people to sit down for two, three, four months and discuss all these things, these things that aren't working anymore. They're not, they were utopian ideas. They don't work. I, as a matter of fact, I'm offended that my taxpayer money goes to Africa to build uh, water. Um, uh, water, water and sewage disposal systems. Now you may say, well, you're, that's really nasty. Yeah, I'll do that myself if I want that done. I'll send the money myself. I don't want to be forced to send that money over there when our country's hurting over here. I want my money to be sent here. Well, just like anybody comes over in our country and they hand them everything for free, and yet if something happens to us and we go and they go, no, you can't have it. It's like our money went anyway. Well, um, you're right. And America is the last bastion of freedom. And I don't see anybody beating down the doors of North Korea to get in there. No. They're, uh, they're not. Uh, yeah, Dennis Rodman went in. Too. Dennis, thank goodness for Dennis Rodman. He went there and said it was a great country and the leader's great. He said this is the, one of the, one of the best countries I've ever seen. I made millions of dollars playing basketball in a free economy, but I think North Korea is pretty good. But I see him breaking down the doors to get into America. Well, he can get away with it. I see that, but I don't see the other. All right, so let me just uh, uh, go through. Two quick things uh, that's very important. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you what Karl Marx did say. Competition isn't good. Private property rights are not good. Religion is the opiate of the people. No God. Locke would consider Karl Marx irrational. He was irrational. That was an irrational belief. Profit is stealing from people. That's what we're saying today. We're saying that same thing. Class warfare between the rich and the poor. That's what we're doing today. This is Karl Marx. This is what he said. Marx could never hold a job and his family uh, and, a wife, and his wife and six children were destitute. They lived in squalor all their lives. Nine people showed up at his funeral. Um, now, let me read you 
one last thing. Uh, this lesson was on, and uh, we had the carrier, and we had some others that we're not going to show now that the founders talked about. But this whole lesson was on the philosophies of the founders and why they cho chose certain people. Well, I want to read you just very quickly. Um, what Jefferson and Adams were doing. Jefferson wrote Adams back because Adams said, uh, Adams would write four letters to every one that Jefferson wrote. Adams was really, you know, writing a lot of letters. And they reunited their friendship in their, from 1812 to the end of their lives, which was 14 years later, 1826. But uh, Adams wrote a letter about Plato. He says, what do you think of Plato? Because I, I really don't think much of him, and I've read him in all the original. I read him in Latin and Greek and everything. You know, they, these founders were reading all these <laughs> different languages. But here's what uh, Jefferson wrote. He says, I amused myself with reading seriously Plato's Republic. This is what Jefferson said. I am wrong, however, in calling it amusement, for it was the heaviest task work I ever went through. I had occasionally before taken up some of his other works, but scarcely ever had patience to go through a whole dialogue. While wading through the whimsies, the pluralities, the unintelligible jargon of this work, I laid it down often to ask myself how it could have been that the world should have so long consented to give reputation to such nonsense as this. <laughs> now, I want to tell you something. Uh, there's different religions. I won't name them. <laughs> but there's different religions that have snuck Plato into their beliefs and philosophies. There's governmental ideas that have snuck Plato in there. And um, uh, Jefferson and Adams, uh, Jefferson called him having a foggy mind. Plato had a foggy mind forever presenting the semblances of objects which half seen through a mist can be defined neither in form nor dimension. It doesn't work. His philosophies don't work. They threw him out completely. They knew what they were doing. They took the philosophies that work. They formed the nation that we had. We don't have it anymore. We could get it back. They formed it based on principles and human nature they knew what they were doing, they bequeathed it to us, and these were great men. We'll see you next week. Thank you.